Hey guys, thank you for checking out this episode. We'd love your support by heading to patreon.com forward slash freshly grounded. It really does make a difference in helping us continue making this content. And if not, no stress. Enjoy. Nasir Karma, more popularly known as Karma Medic, is a fourth year medical student studying at King's Cross London. With a YouTube channel of over 600,000 subscribers, he shares videos on productivity, exam tips and very, very long study with me sessions. Nasir is Palestinian and Jordanian, born in Canada, raised in Greece and living in the UK. Welcome to episode 209 of Freshly Grounded. And welcome to Freshly Grounded, the brand new podcast. Well, it's not exactly brand new anymore, is it? Welcome to Freshly Grounded, the podcast. That's better. Created by best friends, Faisal and Sam. Huh? Welcome, I said welcome to Freshly Grounded. After that bit. Created by... After that bit. Best friends, Faisal and Sam. Really? And we are good to go. So thank you for joining me, Nasir, (laughs) to begin with. Happy to be here. I really appreciate it. Right, we're going to begin by yeah. um, picking a topic from our Freshly Grounded cards. Because we've never met before, this is the first time we're ever conversating. The audience are getting to see <laughs> a, a brand new um, two people interaction uh, <laughs> uh, between us. And so I'm going to start by asking you a very, very deep question that perhaps nobody would generally ask you um, when yeah. they first ever meet you. So I'm going to shuffle it to be um, as fair as possible. I just uh, grabbed a few of car- a few of the cards rather than going for all seventy five. Okay, top card question to you, Karma Medic. I'm ready. Describe your ultimate cheat meal. Not as deep my as I thought. Ultimate cheat meal. Yeah. Oh man! Like as soon as you said that, my mind jumped straight to one place. That's what I'm going to go with. Um, and it's chicken and waffles drenched in maple syrup. Have you ever had that before? No, I think I have. It's, I think when I went to Dubai, I think when I went to Dubai, I did because it's it's quite an American thing, isn't it? Or is it Canadian? Yeah, yeah I was introduced to it in Canada, in from. Toronto. So I, I think that's probably where it's from. I haven't really seen it here, but man, it's so good. But really, once you eat it, you feel like you need to pass out. Really, it's fried chicken, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, so deep fried chicken on a thick, thick waffle, and then it's pretty much swimming in maple syrup. So it's it's really, really sweet, super high calories, um, but it's good. It tastes great. You know what? That's not too far off of my ultimate cheat meal, which is um, is French toast. But like, but not just French toast. But it is because the type of French toast I'm talking about is it's brioche bread. It's um, a lot of sugar. There's cinnamon. There's loads of maple syrup. uh, There's fresh cream. Um, So it's in no way (laughs) healthy. We're not talking like your average French toast. So in fact, there's a place when you're back down in London, you should check it out. There's a place called Christopher's uh, in Covent Garden. Okay. And they're known to do like the best French toast in London and I can vouch for it. I've been there. So check out Christopher's, man. I'll put it to my list. I've got, I've right. got a list of restaurants in Notion to check out. So I'll oh. add it there as soon as this is over. <laughs> oh, amazing. We'll, we'll, we'll get into Notion and stuff in a second. But right. um, we'll carry on because I, th- I feel like I'm already getting to know you a lot better than uh, perhaps the average person who knows you through your videos. I don't think you've ever mentioned your ultimate cheat meal in any of your videos. No, nah, definitely not. That's a first. <laughs> Let's not hope Let's hope we get two out of two. Um, okay, so now we're going deep. Now I have to change the whole vibe of the conversation. What right. are you overthinking? What am I overthinking? Mm. I think maybe social media would be a good response for that one right now. Um, I feel like now when I post something to my Instagram story or when I post something to my feed, I'll think about it and check over it a lot more than I used to. Um, Back in the beginning when I was just like a lot smaller than I am right now, I want to post something on my Instagram story or whatever, I would just post it and not care at all. Whereas now I'm overthinking uh, how people might interpret what I write or the different types of uh, audience who might see it, what they might think. How does this uh, put me in a professional life from like a medical point of view? So yeah, I'm, I'm thinking a lot more about that. Whereas that's something that I used to not do at all before. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm overthinking Why that. do you think that is? <clears throat> I think, I think just, yeah, with the like recent growth that my channel has had, I feel like there is the opportunity for more people to see it and for, 
a smaller percentage of that group to maybe misinterpret something or think negatively about something that I've written or said. And, you know, that's, that's like my worst nightmare. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish anyone to interpret something negatively that I've said because I, I don't say anything in a negative way. I don't mean it in a negative way. And I would hate for someone to look at it like that. So I feel like I'm always quite careful now about what it is that I post and what I say, um, which I think is natural and, and should be the case anyway. You should be careful with what you say, especially if you have a larger audience. Um, but it's something that I feel like I'm maybe overthinking a bit too much at the moment. Yeah, this is something I was thinking about earlier because um, I saw your most recent video with uh, Ali Abdal, um, you, the, the, the Q&A that you guys did. And yeah. one of the thoughts that ran through my mind when he was speaking about um, everybody has uh, the good a good reason and then the real reason, right? So when we were speaking about that kind of uh, aspect, when talking about things that you, that, that you do and the intentions behind them, it, it made me kind of think that, I think one of the, one of the things that, makes Ali so subscribable if that's a word you just want to yeah. kind of see more content from him is because he's one of the few youtubers who you can instantly see that it's just plain honesty at all times he's very transparent with every aspect of his life he provides yeah. so much honesty and even if that honesty comes across or may come across insincere like the idea of like why did you start a youtube channel and, and he just said look to be honest it was a business move for me yeah. at first yeah. um and then it made me realize one thing. It made me realize that um, like kind of marrying that with the idea that you just said about about as your channel grows. And, and first of all, congratulations, man. You're, you're at 600,000 subscribers. That's, that's a massive deal. Thanks. Um, yeah. It's pretty well. I, I think that it makes sense what you're saying about the idea of like as your channel grows, you, you're more conscious of the things that you that you say. But. I, I almost feel like you should push against that because it seems like, you know, they, there's that saying that real recognize real and, you know, the other, um, uh, people, you, you, you can't fake it and, and people's natural personality is always what's worse. And, and that honesty, I think, is what's got perhaps you this far and, and, and Ali this far. And it's so, um, it's so lovely to watch someone who's so transparent with things like, for example, uh, Ali talking about his finances or talking about um, he, he, his growth. So, yeah, it seems like it's a, a challenge that has to be pushed, pushed, pushed back against. So I think the, the reason that I said I'm overthinking it is because I, I genuinely believe I shouldn't feel this way. And I'm, right. I don't think anyone should feel this way. I think you should be able to express yourself how you want, you know, as long as you're not harming anyone or spewing hate or anything like that. Um, I think you should be able to express yourself how you want. And so that's why I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, why am I feeling this way and how can I tackle it? How can I move past it? Um, you know, just, just like anything else, if you're not good at something, if you're trying to learn a skill, if you're trying to get better at something, you need to think about it, expose yourself to it and figure out how to move past it. And so that, that's what I'm doing now with, uh, with this. But yeah, no, I completely agree. Ali is incredibly honest, incredibly transparent. <laughs> Uh, even when I went to see him in Cambridge that day, he was so open with me about how to grow my YouTube channel, you know, uh, what things to look into, what to do, what not to do. Amazing. So friendly, so so giving in his knowledge and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really open guy. How much of the, the – with the growth of your YouTube channel and now with you being right towards the end of your studies in, in medicine – um, I imagine when you started studying in medicine, you only perhaps saw a career in, in medicine, right? And and now that the channel is growing so fast, I, I, how much of that has changed? Like, how much are you thinking now? Well, I'm, I'm in a year or so, I'm going to be done with medical school. Um, mm. And in theory, I should then br begin my kind of, uh, my what One. is it, two years? Yeah, two years of postgraduate training. Right. Uh, but, but has that changed now, now that the, the channel is also growing? Um, it's a good question, but honestly, it hasn't changed for me at all. Like being a doctor and studying medicine has always been what I've wanted to do. And it continues to be my number one priority. YouTube as sort of this thing that started out as like a fun side hobby and now has like grown into so much more than that. Uh, it really is for me, like still a fun side hobby. It's not something that I'm planning on taking full time. It's not something that I'm planning on, um, Sorry, I am planning on keeping it up like 100% and, and growing it as much as I can. But it's not something that I want to take away from my number one priority in, in life, which is to become a doctor. Um, that's still what I think will bring me the most satisfaction in my life um, and the best longevity moving forward. So that's what I'm aiming for. That's what I want to do. Um, and yeah, the YouTube thing on site is something I really enjoy. It's something that I want to do as well. So I'm going to keep it up for as long as I can.
Yeah, you you come across as someone who needs to be like uh, taking control of his time and productive at all at, at all points and having such Absolutely. such enormous tasks like running a YouTube channel and being a doctor seem like they will they will do that they will do that job they'll fill up yeah. that time for you. It fills up my time quite well. <laughs> I'll say yeah. that. <laughs> oh no, I'm glad to hear it. Right. Let's do one last one before we get into conversation because I feel like we were we're opening up here. So again, absolutely random. Okay, I'm trying to think, is this similar to the last all right, I'm gonna pick two and I'm gonna choose the best one because this one I like it, but it might be similar. I'm gonna choose which one. Okay. I'm gonna go with the with the second one. The question okay. is, when was the last time you faced a fear and how did you feel afterwards? Hmm. Last time I faced a fear. You know, I think um, I think like coming on this podcast is quite fitting because a lot of people get surprised when I tell them this, but I have a fear of public speaking. I have a fear of like presenting in front of large groups of people. Wow. Um, and I should correct that. I'm, I don't have a fear of it, but I feel that my body reacts in such a way. And the physiological response of my body is that of someone who is stressed in that situation. Right. Um, so like one of the reasons that I want to have these sort of long form conversations on podcasts and things like that is because I want to get used to, you know, presenting or talking to an audience, talking for longer periods of time about serious subjects, not so serious subjects, etc. Um, I think it's something that like is a weakness of mine and I want to work on. So, okay, maybe it's not a fear. Maybe, maybe it was the wrong answer to your question. Um, but it's like, it's something, yeah, that I, I see as a weakness and I want to work on it and improve on it. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing. There's this very like Dale Carnegie-esque mentality, uh, but I, d I don't know which um, psychologist it is that made it really popular in recent times. I did, I did research it a few weeks ago, so I feel embarrassed that I can't remember exactly who kind of founded this mentality but um there's this concept in in in, in social psychology that um the same the same uh feeling that is associated with fear um are, are, are the exact same kind of um responses your body gives for excitement right that's basically right. Like the crux of it um and <clears> so <throat> uh, and and they said that um they did a study on uh, if you look at olympic athletes right like once they've um when they're about to start their race they are they showed all of the signs on a scientific level um yeah. of a person who is scared a, 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 a heartbeat that's like going incredibly fast um and and so on and so forth i can't remember the the, the kind of like medical or scientific kind of things that they were going through but they yeah. matched a person who was extremely nervous and extremely fearful yet when they were being interviewed oh. before their race they were mm -hmm. saying i'm so excited and and they were giving such positive kind of affirmations and um what these psychologists kind of broke down and said and they, they, they basically said that every time you feel nervous and scared almost trick your mind into telling yourself you're excited because you'll realize mm -hmm. that it requires the same exact same, it requires the same pot feelings in your That's body. So you could, thing, it's uh, actually a very easy uh, thing to channel. Yeah. I mean, that, that kind of makes perfect sense, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's a good point. And, and it could be what's happening. I don't know. Um, but again, yeah, it's, it's something that I'm trying to work on. Who, who did you say came up with that? Dale Carnegie? I can't remember who came out with it. Dale Carnegie is the guy who wrote um, in the 1930s. He wrote, uh, you would have heard of this book, um, How to How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he oh, also, yeah. yeah, he also wrote um, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. Mm -hmm. That one I have. Um, so <clears throat> it's not necessarily, I don't think it's him that came up with this, th with this thing. Uh, I can find out who it was, but it, it, it's a kind of, it's the kind of thing that Dale Carnegie would have come up with, you know, like he's very, have you read um, How to um, Win Friends and Influence People? No, no. Oh man, is it a good read? Oh, I'd really recommend it. Yeah, oh, it's really? just yeah. It's, it's, he wrote it in 1936 or something, but it still relates so much to 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 now. It's shocking. <clears throat> um, little things I picked up on that, like he was um, that he mentioned. Hold on, here we are. I'm just gonna find out. Uh, no, I didn't write down the name. Anyway, um, no, most of what I read. So, like, Jen, for the longest time, I always thought of those types of books, let, let's call them maybe like self-help books or self-improvement. Yeah. I always dismissed them growing up, like when I was a teenager, I thought like they were just full of crap and they wouldn't be useful. And then sort of 
my early 20s, I, I started to see the value in them. And even though I still think there's quite a lot of fluff, you pick up these golden nuggets that are just so, they're actually life-changing. You know, it's like a sentence that I'll write down and I'll look at and I'll think about. Um, so yeah, they, they definitely have so much more value than I'd originally thought of. And a good example of that is recently I read Atomic Habits. Yeah, James Clear. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the things I was realizing I already do myself, you know, um, but ha putting them into words and sort of uh, identifying with what exactly they're called or what scientific uh, principle it relates to, I found really valuable. Yeah, that's like a, another go-to book. Um, and I agree with you, Nasi. Like, I'm, we, I, I think we're completely the same page. Even, even, even now, there's so many... Um, yeah, like self-help guys and and uh, and that kind of stuff that we do need to be wary of. And I think now more than ever with, with media and social media and with technology being so easy to access, anyone being able to create a channel or create a, uh, even like write, even, even book writing has changed so much in the last few decades. It went from like really mm -hmm. working hard at writing a book to trying to put it in front of publishers, pitching it to them, getting loads of no's and then eventually getting a yes. And now it's gone yeah. from, from that manual task to going onto a website that will publish your book for like every time every time it sells they'll print it right they print it like on demand so you could just self publish like within seconds and have it on amazon um but that's why i really like dale carnegie's book because he wrote it in 1936 and so that was a time i think when there were it wasn't as easy and so i and not only is it the fact that he wrote it in 1936 that makes it appealing in the sense that, you know, there were less of those kind of gurus, um, but also because it's such a timeless book. Like, I'll, I'll give you some examples of some of the things he mentioned in that book. Um, so the, the concept of the book is kind of about networking, right? Getting better at speaking to people and, and, uh, and so on. And mm. um, an example is one of the chapters he wrote was called something along the lines of <laughs> stop sticking your butt in people's face. And he said that a simple a simple change in the way you speak uh, and replacing your buts with ands can really um, make you more of an endearing person. And so the example he gave was, imagine, for example, your child comes home from school, they got their maths results and they say, oh, you know, dad, I'm so happy I, I got um, uh, I got an, uh, an A in maths. Um, and you turn around and you say, oh, congratulations, that's amazing. But uh, maybe we could do that's better fair. in English. Right, right. Uh, that but what that but does, as we know, is it um, is it kind of like eradicates and removes all of the compliments that came before it. Yeah. Whereas if you just change that but to an exactly, there's no as soon as the person hears the but, that's it. Uh, whereas if you change that but to an and, it becomes yeah. hey dad, I've, I've I've got an A in maths, and it's like congratulations. And next year we'll try yeah. and work on the English too. So <laughs> it just it doesn't it doesn't remove that. So things like that were really effective, and and stuff like he said. Um, somebody's name to them in any language is the sweetest thing they'll ever hear. And it's true, like just using someone's name, constantly saying, yeah, Nasir, I thought this. And, and you know, what do you think about this, Nasir? It's like so uh, lovely to hear your own voice. And it's, it doesn't even, it's not that it calls to the ego, but it, it engages you, yeah. right? I feel like you've got a, a repertoire of like tactics you can use in order to to get on my side and make me feel more familiar with you. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're filtering through what, what am I going to use next? What am I going to say next? <laughs> no, no, no. But um... it, 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 ma it makes perfect sense. And, and I agree as well. And um, I, what you were saying before about uh, how, how book writing has changed so much from before and now, I find it so fascinating when people do things for the first time or people do things when back then when there was much less uh, knowledge available at our fingertips like this man coming up with something like that was a lot a lot less known whereas if you google that now you'd probably get maybe five or six different hits of people who have talked about this idea or put forward this theory um so yeah it's, it's amazing it's amazing what people come up with so far back when we had relatively nothing I think there's also something um, profound in, in, in the way people work um, nowadays. And, and specifically, uh, when I look at your channel, I think the thing, the thing that... So I first saw your channel thanks to the YouTube algorithm. Um, mm. And it and I'm, I think it was Shut a study up. with me session. <laughs> uh, yeah. The algorithm is working in your favor, man. It was like... it was. I'm sure it was a study with me session. And okay. it was something... The title was something like 10-hour... Uh, live study session mm. and I had to click I mean that is the best <laughs> form 
That is the best form of clickbait because it's not clickbait, but it's so no, it's you it's know true. what it's the type it's the type of thing that's like the type of thing someone would use as clickbait and it wouldn't be true. But oh, you yeah. see it; it's great <coughs> clickbait and it's and it's actually true. You're seeing ten hours at, at a time. So um, I, let, let's delve into that, man. I've I've seen people do study with me sessions. I've yeah. seen people do kind of like the the fifteen minutes and then a break and then and back at it. But you you were the first person I saw who did like a 10 hour stream of just straight studying. How does one concentrate for that long? And what's the reception been of your audience with that kind of stuff? All right, let, let me give some context first, because as you know, context is really important. <laughs> so first, let me say that that feeling you had when you clicked on my 10 hour video, that's the exact same feeling I had when I was looking up study with me video. And I saw that this girl had done a 12 hour study session. Wow. And I was like, how in the world did someone do a 12 hour study session? And I realized that all the other study with me videos were like one hour, two hour, like maximum, I think four was what I saw at the time. So I was like, and, and she had millions of views. And I was like, that's mad, you know, I, I can replicate that, I can do that. I study 10 hours a day. So, so that's how, how I got the idea to do it. Um, and then you're asking, how can someone study for 10 hours? So context, um, over the summer now, I was studying for an exam called the USMLE Step 1, which is this huge monster of an exam that you are required to write if you want to practice medicine in the States. And it is eight hours long. It covers like an undergraduate degree worth of science material and then your first two or three years of medical school. So it's, it's like monumental, it's a huge, huge task. And the average amount of time that students spend studying for this exam is somewhere between nine and 13 months. That's sort of like go-to advice, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's sort of like the go-to advice, that's what most students do and that's what's recommended. And I was trying to do it in four. So I was on, in a significant time crunch trying to like do all of this studying in a shorter period of time. And as a result, I had to, <laughs> to do pretty crazy things like study for 10 hours a day for extended periods of time. So that was sort of the backdrop on which this happened. And then as far as how I can actually study for 10 hours in a day, there's, like, there's so many different techniques and tactics and things that you can do uh, to help push yourself and keep going. What, what, what kind of techniques do you do you use? Mm. So I feel like over my like studying career, all my time spent studying in like high school, university, um, well, both universities now, I feel like I try and always push myself to study for as long as possible before I get up out of my chair and go to take a break. Because for me, the hardest part of studying is actually sitting down and saying, OK, I'm going to start reading that without pulling out my phone or pulling up, pulling up a video or something like that. So the least amount of times in my day that I can sit down and start studying is going to lead to me studying the most amount of time. Anytime I get up to go to the bathroom, to go to the kitchen, to get a glass of water or whatever, that's an opportunity for me to like break out of the studying zone, to like mm -hmm. go off and do something else and procrastinate. And so I do my very, very best to keep myself sat in that chair. That's like probably the first thing that I do. I just like keep telling myself half an hour more, 20 minutes more, one more lecture, this, this and that. Until I hit four hours. Four hours is like my mental mental max. I can't, can't really do more than that. Uh, where does your phone go at this point? My phone gets chucked across the room onto my bed. <laughs> if it doesn't get chucked, then I will purposefully go place it underneath my blankets. Or I'll go to the kitchen and put it in my cutlery drawer. Or I'll go to my sister's room and I'll throw it there. It doesn't really matter as long as it's out of reach. The more difficult it is to like just reach for your phone, glance at your phone, think of your phone, then you're, you're really not gonna do it. Like, trust me, nobody wants to get up and walk two rooms across, open the door, lift the blanket and get their phone just to check it. Nobody wants to do that. <laughs> so the further away you put it, the less likely you are to go check it and use it. And that, that helps me like study for longer periods of time. And that four hour kind of uh, <clears throat> stint that you can do, did you have to build yourself up to that? Or was it always, was four hours always kind of the max? I get, oh, I get. It was four hours oh. the minimum, sorry. Oh, it, it, it's, it's always been the max. Like, I, the I, max. I haven't studied for more than four hours, like maybe four hours and 10 minutes or something on, on the off chance. But was your max ever like an hour and then you built, it, you built your stamina up? So I get asked this a lot. And if I'm honest, like, I don't remember studying in less than four hour blocks unless whatever I was doing required less time than four hours, if that makes sense. But... It, it, it only makes sense that I didn't start studying at four hours from, from year eight, from year 10 or whatever. Um, but back then, I didn't really have four hours of work to do. You know, I would come home from school. I would bang out like an hour, an hour and a half max of homework. And then I would just play video games with my friends. Like, I, I didn't really put in those like huge, huge shits. 
only when I was studying for the IB exams, like in my finals, finals or whatever. Um, that's when I started studying for longer periods of time. And I would study in four hour blocks uh, in high school as well. So I guess it started like quite early on. It isn't something that I developed in university. But <clears throat> I should say this is only for like intense exam periods, right? Like I don't come home from a long day of medical school and sit down and study for four hours. These four hour blocks are done when I've decided I'm gonna spend the entire day studying, you know? And that's like, and that, that way I break down the entire day into smaller blocks of four hours, if that makes sense. So uh, how important is your environment when studying? Because if I'm not mistaken, you're a person who is, and I hope I get this right, born in, hold on a second, let me get this right. Born in Canada. True. Raised in Greece. True. Studied in, uh, hold on, let me go even further back. You're Palestinian and Jordanian. Yeah. Born in Canada, raised in Greece. True. Um, I want to say studied back in Canada. (laughs) Yeah, I went to Toronto for my undergraduate degree. And then now studied in, now you're studying in London, in the UK. That's insane. There's so many, there's so many things to depict from that. But, but it, it sounds to me like you have to almost with, with constantly traveling um, for a lot of us, myself definitely included, I have to have this physical space around me. I have the thing, the, the environment has to be right. I often put on, on you, this sounds so sad, but instead of like watching study with me videos, I often put like a, a like a, a an, an ambience video on, on YouTube, right? Like it might oh, be like, like a fire, like a rain. fireplace or something. Rain. Yeah. yeah. I do that with, uh, with like rain and, in a forest when i'm in the yeah. library and like i, I, I like, like the, the coffee shop one say again i like the coffee shop one you can like hear in the background like people like ordering coffees and all this i don't know why but anyway um i so so uh, you have to build this physical physical experience I, I found so have you managed to find a way of doing that kind of within your mind um or have you stayed in places long enough for you to create that physical kind of space yeah i mean uh when so I moved to Greece when I was only a couple of months old, and I stayed there for 18 years. So I had plenty of there to, had plenty of time there to, you know, build the study environment. I mean, it was just my bedroom, right? It wasn't anything yeah. special. And then in Canada, I was there for four years, and then here I've been here for four years. So I, 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 it's it's not the case where I've been constantly moving countries uh, or anything like that. I have had like longevity. Um, and as far as the study environment, it doesn't really matter to me as long as it's not messy. Like my my environment needs to be clean. Um, like all these cables that you see here, right? This is yeah. this is my desk. This is not my desk. <laughs> if if it was my desk, like you you wouldn't see that for sure. Not not that that would stop me from studying, but I would definitely clean it up before I started, if that makes sense. Um, you know, a, a clean environment for me is a clean mind. Um, so that that really helps me like get into the zone and stay in the zone as well. Let's let's talk a bit about public speaking. You mentioned that you you want to do long form kind of podcasts and. And, and more YouTube content so that you can become more confident in, in the realm of public speaking. Um, yeah. If it was up to you, what would you, what, where, and how, how what would you do public speaking wise? You're, you, let's say, for example, you're given a stage, what would you love to speak about? And you're not allowed to say medicine and you're not, uh, not allowed to say productivity. I'm taking with the two big things away. So you're on a stage, you've got a thousand people in front of you. What would you love to talk about? Jeez. I mean, other than those two very big parts of my life, um, I'd probably love to talk about tech. Uh, like, I don't, know, I don't know if you feel like that's a cop out answer or not, but you know, tech plays such an important role in my life. And like, when I when I purchase a tech product, when I'm researching what product to buy, like, I go so so deep into every single spec. I love to know exactly what I'm getting, what its value is, what it's worth. Um, and I'm fascinated by technology. Everything that we, everything that we use, everything that we get, is so incredible. Um, and I think, I think it would have to be that. Yeah, tech probably the third, third thing. So, had you not gone into medicine, what do you think that your career path would be? Do you think it would be tech related? Uh, I've had this asked many times, but I think if I was going to have like a dream career that isn't medicine, it would probably be something like in sports. I don't know, like snowboarding or something like that. Some, something not related to like a desk job or a traditional job, let's say. Um, Fine. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I got uh, considered that career ever. Uh, it's always been medicine. Medicine's always been the focus. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah, well, I was thinking about this the other day, Zona, well, and, and I came to the conclusion that if it wasn't um, like where I'm at now, I 
I think that you know when you're younger, you get asked this question. I remember I very very what clearly you- remember in primary school being asked, "What do you want to do when you're older?" <clears throat> and we were maybe in like year two, and we had to write a whole a whole story on it about like what we would do when we were older. And the thing that frustrated me is I looked around my class and everybody knew. Like, I know that at that age, you're, you know, you're seven years old. You don't really believe it. But you, you, but, but at that age, you have the innocence of, of, yeah, believing it, I guess, actually. Like, you have the innocence of going, yeah, I'm really going to do this. And I remember just being quite frustrated that I, I, that I drew a complete blank. I couldn't think of anything. And uh, I ended up writing about being a fireman because I just thought that's a, a boy, uh, that's a kind of answer that a boy would give. Like, yeah, I want right. to be a fireman. But that wasn't, that wasn't true. I would, I would never want to run into a blazing fire. You have to be so brave for that. I'm not, I have, I have zero bravery. Um, but I realized the other day that I think that what I would have loved to have done had I not been where I am is be a detective. Mm. Which is, it sounds like a cool job, doesn't it? A cool like Hollywood kind of role. It does. Have you played the game L.A. Noir by any chance? I have not. I studied criminology, so I have some... Oh, okay. I have I mean, some, I, like, backing in it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You, you've, got, you've got some reason to believe you would be good at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, L.A. Noir is a video game based around, like, a L.A., I think it's L.A., like, police detective, and the whole point of the game is to, like, crack cases and things like that. But it's a, it's a good game if you're into that type of thing. Fine. Yeah, again, I, I, I realised that I probably wasn't brave enough to be on the streets as a as a PC um, <laughs> and I'd need to be behind that desk, like just interrogating. So uh, I remember telling this to uh, one of the guys uh, who who kind of works behind the scenes at Freshly Grounded. And mm. I was I was saying to him, oh, I was having this thought and I was thinking, oh, I would I, I would I would have perhaps try to chase down the career path of, a, of being a detective. And he said, how interesting is that, that being a detective is this concept of st- sitting on one side of the desk, interrogating somebody else. And he said, you do that exact thing in your career. And I was like, wow. And even I was, if you ever, ever see our studio, um, and, and, and hopefully you'd, you'll come down uh, kind of sometime and, and we'll have an, an episode in person, you'll see yeah. that it's, it's like a detective style desk, like we sat over each other and all have these light that? bulbs. Of the desk making everything look really gloomy and intense <laughs> i i should i should create like a series on that or something but we've got these like ikea light bulbs for now they'll, they'll have to do okay place a two-way mirror like to your left and you'll be yeah complete. exactly oh, they need. look so they look so cool as well don't they they do um I, you know like when i was a kid and i got asked that question like in grade two or three or whatever um, I don't remember what I wrote, but it was either like an archaeologist looking at dinosaur fossils and whatever, or an astronaut. Those were the two things that interested me as, as a kid, like space and then, uh, and then dinosaurs and looking up their fossils and things like that. Um, but I, I genuinely think, I, I don't want to say nobody, but most people, they don't know what they want to be as, as kids, you know, and we are kind of forced to decide early on. And I always say that when I was a kid, I said, I want to be a doctor and I know I want to be a doctor, right? But I, I didn't know what that meant at all when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old. I had no idea what actually being a doctor is like. And it's not the case that I had doctors in my in my immediate family and I like had gone through all these experiences or anything like that. It was just sort of this thing like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a doctor. I know I, I want to be a doctor. And then only after gaining that actual experience did I realize what the job of a doctor entails. And I was like, OK, this fits me and this is what I want to do, you know. Um, but being asked when you're a kid, it's, it's like it's almost irrelevant, you know. Yeah, I, I th- that's actually sprung up quite an interesting question that I, I think I'll know your answer on because of your experience. Uh, and I think you and I will differ here. So do you th- do you believe that a person can chase their their dream, right? Chase their, uh, their, their, their goal. Those, those things that we, that we think, oh, if, if I, you know, could do whatever I wanted to do, I would, I would, I would ch- chase this dream or start this business. Do you think a person can do that? And have a safety net at the same time. So uh, a lot of us, for example, um, we want to start this like great business and, and we never make that jump. Right. Like, and so we say, no, I'm going to try and do it at a time where I can kind of build my career in the corporate world, for example, and mm-hmm. then cross over once I've built this built business up. So it's seamless. So I never go through like a struggle. Do you think yeah. that's a, a possibility or do you think there always has to be a jump? I think it's absolutely a possibility. I think you just have to be willing to work twice as hard. You have your full-time job during the day, which is your safety net, your corporate job, whatever. And then you need to work, the equivalent of a full-time job outside of that in order to make your your dream work or whatever it is that you're working towards um and you know like 
being someone who's pretty risk averse, like I genuinely like to make calculated decisions and like think things through before I do them. I'm not really that spontaneous of a person. I could never advise someone like, yeah, just go for it, quit your job, mm. like put, put all your time into YouTube or Instagram or, or a podcast or, or anything. I could never, those words would never come out of me because I realized how low the chances of success in those fields are. And I would always say you can balance both. Like I always tell anyone who tells me, I don't have time for this, I don't have time for that. I'm like, yes, you do. You do have time. You just need to reorganize your time, think about where you're spending it and choose deliberately where to spend it. I definitely think both are possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, I, th- I, th- I think that's where I and I agree. I, I agree with you on so many levels. I don't disagree with you. Okay. And I think you it's can... a smart thing. <laughs> and no, no, okay. I actually don't disagree with you. I, I think, and I think that's a smart thing to say. And I also think that you're right. But I can't change my opinion, even though I feel like I'm wrong and I'm like bathing in my wrongness. Um, is... And I'll explain. Okay. I'll, I'll explain. But for some reason, I just realised that my I don't have my. Uh, Charger. So I'm gonna have to let me run and grab my charger. So the laptop doesn't die on our conversation. Yeah, that's cool. uh, yeah um, so, okay, fine. So, um, I, I, the reason. So I think that the difference in our opinions is due to the, uh, the difference in our personality traits. Because you mentioned something that's really interesting. You said you're quite risk averse, and I would consider myself the complete opposite. I yeah. I, th- I think I take too many risks, and it's been because of that a lot of failures. However, because of that, I've also seen some successes. Um, and I do feel like the successes would not have come if I, w- if I didn't have that trait. Uh, mm-hmm. But also, inevitably, I would have also not had some of those failures, which have been really painful. But um, uh, I, 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 think for, I think it depends on your, a person's personality trait. I think if, like yourself, you can be the person who can work very hard and manage his brain, manage his mind, separate things. I'm in my corporate job now. Now I'm chasing my passion. And uh, I'm going to sl- give this much time to this and give this much time to this. Then I think mm. that you're right. And I think that's a best case scenario. However, if a person were to have a personality like mine, where you are so erratic that you just cannot manage your brain mm. into portions uh, right. and you can't manage your time into in, in a manner in which you can handle multiple things, then... Um, I, what I cho- chose to do, I guess, is just completely go like 200% on the one thing, um, take a huge risk, but mm-hmm. like almost like bet on myself, right? That, that yeah. look, if you're going to, if you're going to do it, if you're going to take this risk, you better not fail now. Like you better go all the way in and stuff. And, and I think that if I'm trying to separate that time, um, I'm not giving my best to either. Perhaps that's what it is. I'm, I'm trying to kind of break it down. You know, like, as, as we speak, I, um, I thought about. It. I, I like I 100% see the merit in in going for it and putting everything you have into it. But what I want to ask you is, could you tell someone else who maybe doesn't have a safety net and is thinking of taking this leap of faith and going for it? Could you could you tell them like, yeah, man, do it. It worked out for me. If you if you put everything you've got into it, it could it could work out as well. Do you do that? Like, if if your buddy came to you and he's like, hey, man, like I don't want to work my corporate job anymore. I'm sick of this. I'm going to put all my time into photography. I want to be the best photographer on TikTok and Instagram. And they have huge success there, right? It's, it's definitely possible. Yeah. But it's like, I could, I could never advise someone to do that, you know? I think you're right. I think advising people is, is, is tough. You don't want to feel like you're, you're ruining their life. But <laughs> as you're speaking, I'm just thinking about my story. I'm thinking like, I, I was thinking, so, yeah, maybe you're right. You- when you have dependence, when you have dependence, you wouldn't take as much risks. But when I... Um, so I was working at, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, I always have this issue. The, everyone knows, but I always have to go around by ways. I was working at a uh, leading technology store uh, of that so laptops and mobile phones that most of us have. And, oh. um, <laughs> and um, which was lovely, man. And it's such a great company to work for. Yeah. Um, and you get all of these kind of um, advantages of working for them uh, yeah. and all these perks. Yet... And I had just gotten married, right? And so I probably needed it more than I had ever needed it before. Yeah. And um, I gave him my notice and I was so excited about it and I had no idea. And I just thought, I'm going to go in on this. So when I, when I think about what I advise others, perhaps I would not directly tell them, look, you should do it, but maybe mm-hmm. I'll tell them my story. And like, yeah, and then I let know, them man, I, yeah, it's a tough one. What do you leave that job to do? And were you starting from scratch as well? Had you not like began building something before then? Uh, sorry, like I, I don't know what the story is at all. Maybe like can you no, catch no, me? No, it's up? fine. Uh, I'm trying to track back a couple of years now. Um, 
yeah, so I left it to build this, to build Freshly Grounded, the podcast. Okay. Um, but it wasn't until about a year after that, um, that actually it took off. Um, and through through live events, through like um, having physical events, uh, we were able to monetize. Um, but I just, I suppose I did have a safety net. I suppose I did have a safety net because... Um, Mm, you open up an interesting discussion here, to be honest. Mm. Um, I don't know. I did. I I I transitioned over to 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 do my own thing. Whether I had the vision for Freshly Grounded as to like what it is now, I can't remember. Yeah. But I did think to myself. One of the thoughts I often go through is. The fact that you're going to be alive for X amount of years, you spend 40 hours of your day, so much of it, and the, the typical thing, like you spend so many hours at this place, why not strive to do it in, and be in an environment that you absolutely love? And that could be working mm. for somebody. I'm not, say, I'm not saying it, it, it won't, but I had this like just this huge dream to create opportunities for myself, but also for others. Um, I just wanted to chase it, man. I think I would never have forgiven myself if I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mm. but maybe i'm speaking from like a place of luxury here because i had a degree i had things to fall back on um i trusted that had i needed to get another job um i had perhaps experience in in, in from in great organizations i had uh, mm. a degree backing me and so perhaps and at that time you know it wasn't like it was covid or anything so finding a job and getting a job you know being born and raised in london having an education um and stuff like that uh it wouldn't be the most difficult thing so perhaps I did have a safety net, and that safety net was, for example, my education and, and, and that kind of stuff. So I don't know, it's yeah. a weird one. I mean, you obviously took a huge risk regardless, you know, finding another job isn't just like a, a snap, snap right. thing to get. Um, and it worked out, and I don't know, it, maybe it depends on what the type of thing is you're doing. Like, um, if, if you're gonna leave your job to go and do something else, it should be the case that that something else is taking up all your time that you would have been at your job. Like, if you can do this both at the same time, I think it would be a um, less than optimal decision to completely leave right, one. You're right. You're right. You could do both at the same time in theory. And that should at least be trialed first. But but like you said, you know, some people's personalities, they're just like, I'm so obsessed with this. I, I want to do it and I'm going to go for it. You know, it, yeah. it does. It does depend. And a lot of my friends are a lot more risk. Uh, I don't know what the opposite of risk averse is. Savvy, risk, risk. maybe. Yeah, risk yeah. happy, risk some. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, than me, and they always tell me like you're too risk averse, you're too risk averse, which is fine. You know, everyone's different, so it might just be the case that it's it's so circumstantial. And looking in retrospect, it's so easy to see sort of the steps that led to success versus what led to failure. Whereas at the time when you're making that decision, it's it's almost like flipping a coin. I feel you never know. Never know. No, look, I, I think that if anybody's listening to this podcast, and I, I'm conscious of the time, I know you, you, you gave us um, uh, uh, some of your, your, your time while you're away, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll round up shortly. But um, I think anybody listening to this podcast and they're at that stage in their life, definitely take Nasir's advice over mine, because I think it's calculated <laughs> advice. Um, and it makes a lot, it makes a, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more logical. Um, but yeah, I think I think in life generally, like no piece of advice. I think I suppose this is where we're coming to. No piece of advice can be like mass, like produced at scale to all personalities, right? Yeah. And so there's a level of like taking ownership over who you are and think, thinking, is does this technique work for me or does this technique work for me? Absolutely. I think like something that I'm I'm very passionate about is that the net result of your decision, whatever your decision is, should be that you at least try whatever your dream is, whatever you're going for, whatever you plan to build. Whether you do that in small amounts while balancing a second job, or you completely quit one job and go the other, the net result should be that you at least attempt it. There should be no outcome where you're like, no, you know what, I don't even try at all. Even if that means you stay up late at night, like you see your family less, like whatever it is. If you believe in something, if you have this massive dream, you go for it. But how you go about it is a different story and it's very circumstantial. I agree completely. Thank you so much, Nasir. Do you have, to, to, before we round up, do you have time for two, two, two or three more cards? Yeah, Fire? absolutely. Yeah, Sweet. absolutely. Let's do it. I'm going to randomize them again. Yeah, you asked me deep questions earlier. 
they're, they're all deep so it's going to get deep again we have to like channel ourselves back into now like uh, serious mode because they're going to be deep alright I'm going to choose one at random alright hit me I, th I feel like that's too deep we need, we need one that's like going to level us into this a light that heart. was a very that was a very <laughs> deep one I don't think I have any light hearted ones in this pack okay this is fair like, you could answer this in a light hearted way uh, what's a win you could really do with right now and why a win yeah really do it right now um oh no i'm drawing blank <laughs> really sorry yeah oh wait no, no, it's fine i think I'm that's like... the great thing about these cards because you have to if you if you were forced into an answer could it be um it could be as simple as i suppose making sure you get the flight back home <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I don't know. I, I just uh, like a, something that would be great is if I could actually go on like proper vacation to a destination with friends. Obviously, I can't right now. Um, but if coronavirus passed and everything like that, that would be great. I feel like we all need well, that's a, a great bit answer. Of, uh, you know, like a blowout. Just go and completely relax, have lots of fun for like a couple of days in a row, and then get back to our routine. So I feel like things have gotten very, very, uh, you know. Re R routine yeah <laughs> things have gone very routine yeah, uh, yeah. So, well that's a great. great answer that's a great answer so uh i'll take that okay this is a nice one what do you know about yourself now that you didn't know when you were younger mm. Mm. what do i know about myself now uh, I, I feel like now I'm a, a much more of an open-minded person. And when I was younger, I sort of, I thought I had these opinions based on my upbringing and the friends that I was surrounded by, the school that I went to, all these types of things. And then really when I went to university, I sort of had my eyes open and I felt like I learned so much more about the fact that people can have unbelievably different life experiences from me and I wouldn't even know it. The, something like really important I think I've learned is that People, you can't really tell what's going on behind closed doors. People can have like this mask, this face where they're happy and proud and whatever. And then, you know, behind the scenes, something mad might be going on. And to know that that might be the case and that you should be open minded about someone else's situation, I think it's like one of the best things I've learned as I've grown older. That's amazing. All right. Last one. Go for it. And then I'll let you go, I promise. <laughs> I'm chilling, man. I'm chilling. Fine. We're going to miss that one. This is the last one. Let's avoid that. Mm, that's a good one. Okay, this goes with the theme of this goes with the theme of today's conversation. If you were to start a new business today, what would it be? Oh, a new business today. Completely new, nothing to do with. I suppose it'd be tech then, wouldn't it? It'd be tech related, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I um, I've I've had this like business idea from when I was like end of high school, early university, where I thought it would be the coolest thing ever if we could put vaccines into uh, like plants, into crops or vegetables that could be grown. And the reason that I say that is because I think that would help with distribution of a vaccine or treatment to uh, third world countries, places that have no access to proper transportation and are difficult to reach. You could put a vaccine or a treatment into a plant, into a seed, um, I, th I think that's like the coolest idea and it would obviously be incredibly valuable. Um, wow. That, that Do we know if that's something that's possible? Um, I think, I think it is, but like very, very far future from now. I don't oh. think, but well, we definitely don't have a way to do it right now. Um, but maybe in the future. Yeah. It's a very Elon S Elon Musk. esque. <laughs> Yeah, kind of like idea and thought yeah. it would be really, really cool though man because that's something that would like benefit the the world at mass if we could like get it right absolutely oh, yeah. amazing uh no so listen thank you so much for your time man i really really appreciate it. it's been absolutely wonderful getting to know you um yeah. it's been lovely to have you on the podcast and i really really appreciate your time w what was it actually that made you say yes that's a great question that to, to end it on because we hadn't <laughs> ever met before uh, and yeah. I, i'm assuming that you'd never even kind of heard of us or, or, or seen any of our content yeah, so, so what was this it? is the ever podcast that I've done. I've been emailed a bajillion times to, to do a podcast. I think it was a combination of your email. I, I don't know why, it just like it, it reached me. It was like really succinct, straight to the point. 
and you made things very easy for me. You know, you're just like, here's my calendar, book a slot when you're free. And it was as simple as tomorrow. Like you emailed me yesterday for the first time ever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I went online and I searched a couple a couple of clips of you and you just seemed like a really chill dude to have a fun oh. conversation with you, uh, relaxed time. So yeah, I was like, let's hop on. This is going to be fun. Oh, thank you so much, man. I, like I said, I really appreciate the time, and that means a lot. I, oh. I really appreciate the feedback. And listen, whenever you're um, when you're back, I'll, I'll um, shoot me an email. Oh, I'd love to get a, a pack of the cards sent out to you, uh, yeah. to your address, and then, like I said, perhaps we can do this in person sometime. That's a good idea. Where can I listen to this podcast? Where is it going to go? It will be out on um, I on Apple Podcast by searching Freshly Grounded. On this will be out on YouTube um, under Freshly Grounded, uh, Spotify Freshly Grounded, uh, and there'll be some clips of it on our Instagram page, which is Freshly underscore Grounded. All right. We didn't manage so, to get Freshly Grounded on on, on Instagram, unfortunately. We're still fighting there. the battle. <laughs> yeah, um, but it'll be out tonight. It'll be out literally in a couple. Like as soon as we're done here, I'm uploading it. Uh, I just got to oh. export it all and all that kind of stuff. So we we release episodes on a Friday. So awesome, awesome. I'll be watching cool. it back. <laughs> thank you oh. so much Nash. i really appreciate it and, and travel back safe great thanks for your time take care see you, see you later bye